Thank you very much, and I must say I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, uh, during the last year, uh, three uh, actors, I should say, three different actors have published studies uh, showing costs uh, related to human health and endocrine disrupting substances. Uh, I've been involved in a Nordic cooperation where we looked at male reproductive health and I would use that as a starting point and then I will compare the other studies to those results. I will also uh, talk a little bit about strengths and weaknesses and at the end reflect something on what do we want to achieve. Next picture please. So this is the model that we used in the Nordic work. Um, we did not uh, look at chemicals as such but used the knowledge that Jorma so nicely has put on the table now. Uh, so we decided to focus on male reproductive health, and in that saying that we are focusing on antiandrogens and estrogens and the effects on male reproductive health for that. Um, incidences for these diseases were dra drawn from mainly Swedish registries, but we were also using Nordic or European data if it was available. For each of the diseases, we looked at direct costs, that is the costs of uh, medical care and, and surgical uh, treatments. Indirect costs which is the cost of production loss due to disability or uh, time when you have to be in contact with healthcare. And then we have this gray square beneath which is called intangible costs which is related to the suffering and the psychosocial side of, of uh, uh, diseases. Next picture, please. Uh, this summarizes the results uh, for uh, our project. Uh, the red uh, part of the, um, let's see now, I can hardly see the colors from here. Uh, the, the blue part shows the direct cost, that is hospital cost, the red one indirect costs, and the green the intangible. And as you can see, the intangible costs are, are quite substantial here. We have measured them as uh, loss of quality of life or loss of life. Uh, for infertility, that part is missing, and that is due to the, that we couldn't really find a, a method good enough to estimate the psychosocial costs of not having a baby. How do you measure that? So we decided to leave that out. Um, in discussion with experts, uh, we decided that, uh, and also based on what we know about the genetic fraction and, and how much that influences um, diseases and also the fact that there are other environmental factors that might affect the development of these diseases. Uh, we discussed what, how much of the total amount of these diseases could be attributed to endocrine disrupting substances. And uh, the figures that we were given were mostly between 20 and 50 percent. Then we had read some papers uh, of other endocrine disrupting substances which uh, reported etiological fractions around 2%. So we thought, okay, let's make a span of this. So we decided to use, one more thick breeze, uh, 2, 20, and 40% as the etiological fraction. And that renders costs uh, from 59 million euros per year or 592 if it's 20% and 1.2 billion euros per year uh, if it's 40%. Uh, we are also presenting what is uh, called discounting numbers. That is, we have taken into account the latency effect for testicular cancer and for infertility. And if we did not do the discounting, uh, the values would be about twice as high and you can say that if you don't do the discounting, that are the numbers we are paying today for former exposure. Next ple picture, please. So this is uh, the comparison of the three, three studies. Uh, they are slightly different. Uh, the Health and Environment Alliance uh, published their paper in June last year. They had uh, looked at the 
total cost related to endocrine dis uh, to, to endocrine diseases, and they used an etiological fraction of 2 to 5 percent. They only looked at direct costs, and they did not use discounting at all. So the span for, for that calculation says that there is an annual cost between 13 and 31 billions per year. If you compare that to our, that only look at male reproductive health, it turns out that only half uh, a percent to 0.7 percent of that sum was related to uh, reproductive health. So that gave a span, if you look at the 2 percent etiological fraction of 66 to 87 million euros per year, which corresponds quite well with our, our 59 for our 2 percent etiological fraction. This, the middle study, which I call the expert panel study, uh, has taken a different approach than what we have done in HEAL and the Nordic report, which, which kind of starts from the disease end of things. Here, uh, this is a group of scientists that have <laughs> gone together, and they present their work very nicely, I think, in a transparent way so you can see how it's been done. They base their work on methodologies developed by the World Health Organization and the uh, Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change. Um, and they start from unbanned chemicals, chemicals still in use, uh, where there is put, uh, relatively much data available on toxicology, on epidemiology, and biomonitoring data. That is, we can measure that people have been exposed. So for May Reproductive Health, their outcome is 5.7 billion euros per year. What is also very interesting in this study is that they are using a Monte Carlo model to uh, analyze the probability of causation. And if you use this uh, model and make a thousand random runs with it, okay. it gives you a median cost for Euro, Europe uh, of 157 billion per euros per year. And that is for the diseases of obesity and diabetes, it is for neurological disease, and it is for male reproductive health. Those three are included here. And if you look at the span for this probability, so even if you go very, very low in this simulation and say, well, the probability of it being actually true might not be that high, you still end up with a cost of 2.5 million euros per year. And if you go to the high end, it's almost 240 billion euros a year. So there are substantial uh, costs related to this. Next picture, please. They also present their data this way uh, by diseases. And here you can see that uh, for neurological diseases, it's the <coughs> highest numbers, the highest costs attributed to. And divided by chemical, the most costs end up on pesticides. Next picture, please. So I would say that the strength of this work is that we have actually started to get methods to look at this. Uh, there is a growing demand to come up with actual numbers. And so far, usually we do see numbers on costs for production of chemicals and what the effects will be on the market as such. But there is not as much uh, emphasis or much information, I say, available for costs of health or costs of uh, exposure in the environment. So we're very glad that we, in these studies, could at least bring some figures into this equation. Of course, all methods have weaknesses. Um, it's interesting when you read these papers, all of them point to the fact that these are po probably underestimates. And, uh, for instance, ours is clearly, we only look at male reproductive health. It's a very small fraction. Uh, but also uh, the fact that, that environmental costs are not included. It also requires extensive patient registers and or human, ha human health cases, which as both uh, Jorma and Åke pointed towards, is really not what we want. You always have to make assumptions, and there are uncertainties to deal with. Uh, 
one thing that has been on the table already is this causal link. And for the Nordic report and the HEAL report, we have <coughs> assumed that there is a causal link and we have assumed an etiological fraction. The expert panel, however, have not done that. They based it on toxicological studies and epidemiological studies and related it to exposure levels. Um, there are other things, as I said, there are Swedish data used for the incidences and costs in our studies and we have extrapolated. So there are a number of things that you have to take into account. But I think as long as you are open with what you're doing, you can still apply these uh, as part of the picture when you want to decide on how to move forward. Next picture, please. So what do we want to achieve? I would say that the methodology should be developed further. We should use available information, but also experience from before. We should try to learn from what has happened and stop making late lessons from early warnings. Uh, the level of evidence needed, as I pointed to here, all these studies render information from human health cases. And I really think that we need to use methods where we can rely on animal studies or uh, in the future I hope really that we can build models so that we can model this and different scenarios and get the, the information we need from that. It's really a matter if, of if we want to prevent things or if we want to continue to tidy up. Um, I would say next, uh, I would say that if we want to protect our children and grandchildren, we need to start acting now. We shouldn't wait till later. Next. 